it simply, a joint check is a check made payable to two or more parties. A joint check agreement is a contractual agreement whereby one party gives permission to make a payment in the form of joint checks. An example of a joint check agreement from the construction industry would be where the prime or the general contractor agrees to issue a check jointly to the first tier subcontractor and then that sub's material supplier. So when this is done, both the sub and the supplier are paid at the same time. And then the chance of the sub withholding payment from the supplier is reduced significantly. Joint check agreements can be used in any industry. However, these tools are utilized far more in construction than anywhere else. Joint check agreements are most common in the construction industry because so many tiers of parties participate on a typical construction project. This reality of the construction business fits perfectly with the joint check concept. A joint check agreement is commonly entered into between a general contractor, a subcontractor, and a material supplier. So the supplier being hired by the subcontractor wants to protect itself against non-payment and all three parties agree that any payments made by the general contractor for work involving the supplier's materials will be written jointly to the subcontractor and the material supplier. So with a joint check agreement in place, the material supplier is protected against the risk of the subcontractor not paying them, even after the sub received payment from the GC. The general contractor is protected from the risk of the supplier not getting paid and then filing mechanics lien on the project. How? Because neither party will be able to deposit the check without the other's endorsement. So without a joint check agreement in place, when work is completed, then the prime contractor will pay the subcontractor for the work and the subcontractor may delay payment to the supplier to help with their own company's cash flow. Ideally, all parties get paid, but of course, there are inefficiencies and risks that interrupt the proper and fair trickling down of construction payments. Construction contracts and case law have further complicated joint checks. So if you want one to be used, make sure that all parties sign the joint check agreement. If every one of the three parties to a joint check agreement doesn't sign the agreement, then it could come under attack. And the only party who could possibly be forgiven for not signing the agreement is the lowest tier who is receiving the benefit of the agreement. Nevertheless, why roll the dice on this? If you are benefiting from a joint check agreement, you might as well sign it. There is no state or federal law that governs joint check agreements specifically or that offers guidelines. Joint check agreements are a creature of the construction contract itself. In the United States, all parties have the general freedom to contract for whatever they want. The law only marginally restricts this freedom to prohibit folks from violating public policy. So for example, contracting into murder or no lien clauses. So what does this mean? It means there's no such thing as a standard joint check agreement. Accordingly, the parties to a joint check agreement can write the agreement any way they want. While this sounds nice and flexible, the result is that the industry is flooded with a ton of sample joint check agreements, and each of the samples would have sometimes significantly different effects. The joint check rule means that whenever an owner or a general contractor issues a joint check to a subcontractor, and then the subcontractor's material supplier, the material supplier who endorses and deposits the joint check is certifying that it has been paid all amounts due up to the date of the joint check. Be very careful about this. Consider the scenario. You're owed 100 grand for materials delivered to a subcontractor over two months ago. The account's been flagged as high risk, all furnishing has been put on hold, and you've started to prepare a collection plan that may even involve filing a bond claim or mechanics lien. Then the general contractor sends you a check for 85 grand, jointly written to you and the subcontractor. You could really use this money. So should you deposit the 85 grand and then proceed for the remainder separately? I mean, can you really reject this huge chunk of cash? Well, according to the joint check rule, if you endorse and or deposit that $85,000 check, you'll actually be waiving your rights to the remaining $15,000 debt, period. End of story. 
You'll be unable to sue for the unpaid portion, and then any lien or bond claims you file will be considered invalid. Since there is no such thing as a standard joint check agreement, these agreements are subject to the contract between the parties. And as a result, there are differences from agreement to agreement. One huge difference between agreements is that some obligate the paying party to issue a joint check, and others merely give permission to do so. If you think your joint check agreement obligates or requires the paying party to pay you, then when in actuality it only gives the paying party permission, you may have a very difficult time getting paid if the paying party winds up not issuing a joint check. Now, from the paying party's perspective, on the other hand, the misunderstanding that that permission is required only when an actual obligation exists can create a similar bad situation. Joint check agreements primarily benefit the lowest tiered party, like a material supplier. The party making the initial payment, usually the general contractor or property owner, do receive a slight benefit from these agreements, but the benefit pales in comparison to the benefit afforded the party receiving the payment. So general contractors or developers typically don't want to take on additional obligation through a joint check agreement. And that means general contractors or developers typically won't be very motivated to use joint checks. They're pretty inconvenient. Now, there are a few reasons why a paying party would want to avoid joint checks. Keeping track of which lower tiered parties have joint check agreements and which don't is difficult, and it's prone to mistakes. Having to dissect each payment into great detail and make sure everyone is paid in the correct proportion is an added and unnecessary administrative task. Any mistake could leave the paying party with an obligation that it normally would not have. So while paying parties want to avoid new obligations with a lower tiered subcontractor or supplier, they do like the power that comes with permission to issue a joint check. So absent a joint check agreement, a general contractor or developer cannot usually issue a check to a lower tier. Instead, they must follow the standard payment pattern, which is paying their own contractor and then trusting that contractor will pay people down the line. Entering into a joint check agreement whereby their customer gives permission to pay lower tiers on a joint check gives the paying party some additional power to control that payment flow. While they may not need to do this often, if circumstances warrant it, then it's a good risk control tool. So what dictates whether the paying party must, or merely may, issue joint checks? Well, the joint check agreement, of course. Since there are no standard joint check agreements, you'll need to review the language within the specific joint check agreement at play to see which rules apply to your situation. Yes, we know how boring and complex that is. And remember, payment help is here.